Okay, I want to talk about the pilgrimage because I don't think too many people are interested on a Friday afternoon in public opinion, uh, opinion measurement, and those kinds of things. So what I want to do <coughs> is take you on a mini journey. And where this all started, 10 years ago, Will Finnan, the chaplain, Glenn Linden, uh, now departed, great professor of history, and Michael Waters came up with this idea of a civil rights pilgrimage. And then Will Finnan, the chaplain, came to me. I got five breakfasts at La Madeleine for him to persuade me to design a course <laughs> <laughs> that students would take during spring semester, and then at the break point, spring break, we'd head out on the road. And I've done that for s seven years now. And as you'll see, I hope, it's the most rewarding thing I've done as an instructor at Southern Methodist University. And it's also something that has made me terrifically proud of the students at SMU, especially the ones in my classroom. So the pilgrims, as we're called. Parents imagine this. I have grown children now, one of whom graduated from here. How would you like to spend eight days on a bus with 20-somethings? <laughs> OK? Turns out to be actually quite rewarding. So there's my seven groups shown up there. OK, so we leave here on a Friday afternoon, and we head out. Where do we go? Little Rock? Jackson, Mississippi, Philadelphia, Mississippi. Where we are going is ground zero in that civil rights movement. And there are many ground zeros from that period of time. Selma, Alabama, Montgomery, and Birmingham. Tuskegee, Ole Miss, which is a great side story. We're walking up to get a presentation in their archives, and we're going up a staircase, and they all stop and they go, Professor Simon, that looks like a young President Turner. And I said, it is. He was chancellor at Old Miss before he came here. And the kids think that's really cool, because they think you're born a college president at SMU. <laughs> and then Memphis, Tennessee. So that's where we go over the course of eight days. What's more important, that's a tour, but what's really more important to us are the people we meet, extraordinary. And these are scenes with our pilgrims from various years. A family whose house was bombed because they participated in the bus boycott. A family that hid the Freedom Riders, among other things. A woman whose brother and mother were beaten the night they burned the church in Philadelphia, Mississippi, which led to the kidnapping and murders during Freedom Summer. A woman who is an 11-year-old was beaten, leader of the Teachers' March for Voting Rights in Selma, an activist in Memphis, SNCC members, and then people who write and preserve and act now. The grandson of Justice Hugo Black, journalists, heads of institutes, and then what we would call some of the biggies. Fred Gray, who argued the Montgomery bus boycott case before the Supreme Court. Minnie Jean Brown, one of the Little Rock Nine. Rita Schwerner, the widow of Mickey Schwerner, one of those murdered during Freedom Summer, Julian Bond, John Lewis, Bernard Lafayette. And generally, these meetings are with our students with time to interact. So you could well imagine the impact that has. These are keepers of history. These are foot soldiers that they get to personally interact with. This is an award-winning drawing here at SMU. 
But rather than me, I'd like to play an excerpt here and let you hear from some of the pilgrims. They do journals, then we play around, excerpt it, and in an amateur sort of PowerPoint way, try to put something together. Let me tell you that I'm walking early spring semester. I was apprehensive about the class and the journey. First, I would have to take a political science class. Second, I would also have to give up my spring break, the holy week of spring semester, a time that students spend wasting away on beaches and mountainsides across the continent without a care or curfew in the world. Melissa McGuire, Human Rights, English, and Spanish major. Wednesday afternoon, March 13th, on the bus somewhere between Montgomery and Birmingham, Alabama. This indeed feels like a pilgrimage. It's more than a spring break trip, field trip, bus trip. It's spiritual. No matter what you believe in, it's a holy experience. Places like the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, Dr. King's Kitchen in the Parsonage, and the graveyard in Philadelphia are hallowed ground. Sorsha Hepp, Anthropology and International Studies major. Saturday, March 16th, Memphis, Tennessee. As we were driving home from Memphis, I couldn't help but think of the Freedom Riders and how similar our journey was to theirs. Of course, no one tried to blow up our bus and we weren't met by angry mobs in the cities we visited, but we are a diverse group of young students. We laughed together, we sang together, we shared experiences, and we shed tears. We are the living legacy of the Freedom Riders. Emily Mankowski, Human Rights and Political Science. It's me again, the one who started this video. When I began with apprehension, I ended with gratefulness. This was a personal opportunity in which I had a chance to see, touch, and personally experience history. This history remains culturally relevant because racism is not dead. The KKK is not dead. Racial stereotyping is not dead. Discrimination is not dead. And economic disparity is not dead. This pilgrim experience explains why spring break can be so much more than a beach and a cold corona with a lime wedge. Melissa McGuire, Human Rights, English, and Spanish major. Now, one more student, Krista, whom you'll meet, was a dance performance major studying in this very building. She goes on this trip. She was somewhat quiet, pensive, thoughtful. I'm reading her journal, and I came across this. My name is Krista Brown. I am a senior dance performance major with a minor in human rights. There's this statue at Old Miss of James Meredith. And it stands a little taller than me and his face looks so friendly and he's about to walk into the eye of an angry mob. Or he would have been had he been alive. He has one foot forward, one foot behind, the stance of one who's marched through historic times, but he left a hand out for me the fingers splayed slightly, saying, come on, Krista, grab my hand, and we'll face hate together. But his hands, his small and stature hands, were frozen in stone, frozen in a time in which mine could not quite fit. So I grabbed his arm, we took a picture, and he stayed behind because I had to move on. There were other hands to hold or attempt to hold, but these attempts at connection were failed attempts at connection because their hands were so distant from me. They were blocked by ashes, blocked by dust, blocked by pain and misery, blocked by caskets, blocked by water, blocked by ignorance, or like violas, blocked by bars. And I came close to touching her, but my shoulder got in the way, so all I could do was reach and thank and pray. And there were hands wiping tears, hands holding signs, hands raising fists, hands 
pointed in defiance, and my hands, my 2010 hands, were just too short to reach through the hallways of history and hold onto their hands, their strong, beautiful, beaten, and blood-stained hands. So what then do I do now? As the past is a printed and unknown history and the future a not-so-present mystery, and my hands, my modern day hands are too young to join to their hands, thusly limited to my neighbor's hands. And in a world of isolation and internet notification, who might my neighbor be? The poor, the rich, the far, the near, the helpless, the helpful, the hated, the revered, friends, enemies, look, see. My neighbor is you and your neighbor, me. For red and yellow, black and white, we are precious in his sight and I will hold your hand tonight because we're marching the same way. And with my hand, crossing to cling to your hand, your beautiful, strong 21st century hand, and our feet dancing to our modern drum, we march because we have to, for we will and we shall overcome. Okay, the takeaway. Okay, I wanna make three points here. Number one is immersion. For me, I've never had this chance before. It's just not a class, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, you talk about the material, you give the test, they write the papers. We're knee deep in this material about the past and the present. That is an experience uh, that I've come to appreciate. Number two, impressions. SMU students have themselves made a footprint across the South. Our students come to these venues prepared. Their questions, their comments, their interactions show the people we talk to that they're learned. And so I get to sit there and gloat, being very proud that they've gotten the material and the like. And then finally, inspiration. They come back and they ask, what could I do? And they do a variety of things. But what I've seen is students spending three years in the Mississippi Delta with Teach for America. Students going to law school, picking certain subjects. Students becoming sort of apostles of this and spreading the word on campus that this is a good thing to do. And what they come out with is their SMU degree and a commitment to community. That's their takeaway. So immersion, impressions, and inspiration is what answers the question, why don't I take a spring break the last seven years? Because this has become, as I said, the most fulfilling thing I've done at SMU as an instructor.